welcome to another episode of Sailing in Niemann. In this episode, we are going to get into some passage planning because we're trying to head to Cornwall. Blimey! In a week's time. Yeah. Well, less than a week's time. Less than a week's time. In five days' time. No pressure. So yeah, we're trying to get to Falmouth and we may have to tuck in to different places along the coastline. Hopefully we can just do it in a straight shot. That's the aim. Yeah, we just thought we'd actually do some passage planning so yeah. we know where we're going and how we're going to get there. We're not actually that good at passage planning or at least we haven't really got much experience in it. So please don't use this as a how to, how to guide. Um, <laughs> no, yeah, I was just agreeing with you. <laughs> so don't use this as a kind of how to guide that will get you somewhere without any trouble because we'll pro we're probably just as lost as as anyone else is in this whole thing but maybe we can show you the steps that we're going through and how we think it should be done at least and maybe get some comments from you guys as to how we could improve or yeah what we're doing wrong and, and things like that so this is a bit of a learning experience but we're going to go through all of the steps that we're going to take we're going to pick a few little bolt holes along the way that we could get out of some bad weather into or we can you know if we get bored or tired or whatever it is then we can jump into some yeah safe uh, yeah safe havens safe havens safe yes. anchorages or um plan b's plan b's we'll be using paper charts and we'll also be showing you how to sort of use a mixture of um, paper charts and apps so for the diehard true sailors look away now well i think admiralty have said that they're gonna stop doing paper charts soon in a couple of years they're winding down now so um you're gonna have to use electronic navigation at some point and and you know i don't think there's anything wrong with it as long as you know how to use your paper stuff and and that side of it as well so if you're here for some good old sailing maybe go into another episode because this is not really the one for you this is important to us because we want to sort of show you how we can actually do some sailing and do some passage planning we think this is quite informative probably more for us than for you guys but yeah hope you uh, enjoy it's all, it <laughs> yeah it's all a part of our learning and i think we want to take you along with that journey as well so if there's something we don't know then um yeah we're finding out at the same time as you're you're, you're watching it so it's um yeah i think it's important, an important part of what we do so. yeah exactly so hope you enjoy stay tuned stay tuned bye no not bye stay Right, so we're gonna start with a little kit list of things that we've got ready for our passage. Brighton to Falmouth is about 220 nautical miles, depending on how you do it. So there's a fair few things you need to take into account. There's a fair few tides that you have to take into account. And coming from Brighton, the first thing you'll hit is the Isle of Wight. So that is then the first thing that we wanna do, get that right. So we've got a selection of paper charts. We had the Isle of Wight. As a, as a sort of large um, chart. That was for our summer last year. So we're gonna be using that. We've also got the Eastern English Channel, which is C12 for Imray. And that is a sort of wide angled view of, as it says, the east side to the south of the um, UK and English Channel. We have then got a C10 from Imray, which is Western English Channel. So that covers the Isle of Wight and takes you all the way down to the Scillies. So that is a nice big chart overview. So actually then for our, for our passage, the two that we'll look at for the overview are these two. This will take us to the Isle of Wight and this will take, take us from the Isle of Wight to the rest of the way. And then also we've got a tidal stream atlas and this covers all the tidal streams from the west to the east and everything that we'll need to know about. So tidal streams for those who don't know, this will give you the strength of tide and the direction of tide as it runs through the English Channel. And you'll have two numbers on here for each little section. And they are your sort of mean tidal speeds. And it will be on neeps, it'll be 0 0.5 here. And on springs, it'll be 1.0. And that then is four hours before high water Dover. So that's a good thing to have because you need to know your tides. We've also got small craft almanac. This is the 2021 version. We got it last year really to give us tide times, which are all of these for where you're gonna be, but obviously they'll now be wrong because we're a year later. But what it does do, it also has your tides in there. It's also got a lot of safety information in there as well. And 
things about communication so it's um and weather as well so it's it's a good overall handy kind of almost pocket size book to have on board you've still got your tidal curves here so if you wanted to plan anything out on here you could still use these as they'll be in date we've also splashed out and got a couple of these big hardback books so one west country cruising companion and two the shell channel pilot and that's by Imre again and the, tom cunliffe and written, <laughs> written by the legend tom cunliffe <laughs> this really gives huge amount of detail about where we're going to be going the ports that we might be entering and tidal heights and and you know mean, mean tidal heights low and high and general information how to approach what the entrance is like and a good you know a good few pictures as well so actually then you you're looking at something familiar when you approach so it really it really is i think it, it pays dividends to get these kind of um printed books go through them in your spare time and then you you learn little nuggets of information you know the voyage things like that you, you'd be looking out for so yeah that's brixham and looks like a lovely little harbour with a couple of boats moored up outside anchored up uh, oh, actually there's a couple of mooring boys there so mm. that could be something we look at and then to add to our list of charts we've got these big ones chichester to ramsgate this one's a little bit dated now we'll just use it from brighton potentially to the isle of wight we already know that stretch of water so we're not too worried but it's nice to have on board and it gives a lot closer detail than these ones do on top of that from the isle of wight this one will take you through the Dorset and Devon coast and give you nice amounts of detail in all of these little bays. So when we're talking about planning little bolt holes and uh, safe havens, potentially if we're out here and it gets a little bit too hairy, we will then look at these, get into the, the finer detail for any little stop offs that we might want to make on the way. And finally then the West Country where we hope to finish our trip. This will take you then from, I think Salcombe there, Dartmouth, through um, down into Falmouth. So yeah, a real real amount of detail in, in, in some of these ones here, up into the little rivers and things, Helford River, River Fowl. And yeah, that'll be our little exploring chart that we uh, that we get out when we're down there and um, find some little nice pubs and things we can get into. So. <laughs> we're gonna be looking to go from Brighton to the Isle of Wight and then beyond. Yeah, there's a fair amount of tide that whips around here. So we just wanna make sure that we are either gonna take some fair tide with us here, potentially stop off um, at the Isle of Wight, wait for the foul tide or wait out the foul tide and then pick up the fair tide again and bring it round and down. So if we're gonna do that, then we just wanna work out what's the best time to leave Brighton um, on the fair tide that will take us through here and get us there in good time before the tide turns against us. Using a set of plotters, uh, dividers, sorry. So on the side of the chart here, this will give you your miles. So 30 miles, 40 miles. And we then say, well, how fast do we think we're gonna be going? So I'm gonna say average maybe 4.5 knots. And then we say, well, if you do, I don't know, 4.5 knots, and we'll say maybe for three hours, we know then that we'll have covered um, 13 and a half miles. So if we set then the plotters to, so it's 10, 11, 12, 13 and a half, maybe just a little bit more. So we've set these dividers for three hours. So then if we look at Brighton Marina, which is there, put the pin there and we come out to near the wind farm we go that's three hours that's six hours and that's nine hours so nine and a bit nine and a half hours to get to somewhere like Sandown bay where we could anchor there and wait out the tide so nine and a bit hours um obviously then the tides run every six hours so we're gonna have to probably push a bit of foul tide to begin with and then pick up six hours of good tide to land us there before the tide turns foul again. Right, 
Chris has quickly run to go and get some chips for us because um, it's dinner time. So basically what we've been doing is checking out the tides, checking out the time we're leaving and looking at the high water and low water to ensure that we're leaving on at the right time and getting into Benbridge at the correct time as well because apparently it does dry out quite a bit so we just want to make sure that we're in the right spot here. Um, and we also want to check how much tide we're going to be pushing on the way to Benbridge. When we leave Brighton, we are going to be against the tide for the first four hours. And then for the last six, we'll be with the tide on the way there. So hopefully the time we may lose here, we're going to make up on the way on the, those last six hours there. So yeah, so basically we've been writing down how long it's going to take us if we leave. We're thinking we probably leave at sort of midnight now, which is four hours before high water. So that's the earliest we can leave. So yeah, so what we do is we flip to the our little tidal stream atlas and have a little look. So before high water Dover, that's where we look at. And basically this is when we'll be leaving. So we're looking at roughly one, one knot basically of tide that will be against us the first four hours as we come out. And then after four hours, it will change and we'll have the tide with us on the way to Benbridge. So a little bit annoying as we leave. But the time we lose here, we will make up once we've kind of got probably around to this point. So yeah, so that's where we're at, at the moment. Okay, so we've eaten chips and beans and other things, and now it's uh, getting into the night. So we need to really get and uh, get a move on with this. But um, just going to give you a little um, synopsis of what um, what we've just planned. So Lauren just showed you the tide times and and and, and things like that and how we're working that out. Well, there's two options. We either leave on the Saturday morning at 2 a.m. Get over to Benbridge on the a bit of foul tide, bit of good tide, hide out there for the foul tide and then carry on. But looking at the weather forecast, there is like zero wind on the Saturday now. That's the forecast um, that uh, around there and, and on and on the sun on the Sunday as well. So but the rest of this week and it's Monday now, we've got great uh, a great easterly is pushing us down um, all the way if we were to leave a little bit earlier. So we've got a backup plan of leaving on Thursday night. We'd have to call work and tell them that we're not coming in on Friday. But if we do that and we get away with it, leaving on the Thursday would mean leaving at about 11 o'clock at night. Pushing again, the same same sort of tides at that point there. So we will have about four, two to four hours of um, foul and then six hours of fair. But with that wind, which which is going to be there, well, it says it's going to be there uh, between 10 and 15 knots um, or potentially even a little bit more. We know that we can travel. And if we are traveling with the tide in that bit, about sort of five to six knots on good wind if we are doing well. So it could be and we've said, and we've said there's a point that if we get to Benbridge or just off of at like seven in the morning and the tide turns at about 10 o'clock, if we can get there by seven o'clock, then we'll just keep on going. We won't stop at Benbridge because if we say there, this is set to three hours. So if we're there at seven, eight, nine, ten, we're kind of off the point, but we, 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 if we made that decision, we're going to be offshore a little bit further as well to then potentially race round and beat the tide and then have foul tide here as we'll be past that big racing speedy tide there but if not and if we're late then we just go and stick with plan b mm -hmm. and then how that will affect us in terms of fatigue and you know do we need a break and are we working shift patterns by then and, and things like that so it's um yeah we're just discussing what the best option will be but in a way it's like well there's wind behind us then if we stop as well then we'd have to wait six hours and wait out the tide then it's going to be potential the potential then to lose that wind further you know you're, you're looking further into friday then um before we can get underway it's friday evening and yeah we start then running the risk of losing that nice patch of wind that we um that we'd love to ride the coattails of down to cornwall so very nice <sighs> we'll see <laughs> So what are we doing now, Lauren? We are looking at our little refuge spots and we're going to just check them in here to make sure we have all the correct high water and low water times and check the pilotage going in and out of these to make sure we don't 
end up in a pickle. There you go. Familiarising ourselves with the entrance. Um, any kind of key things we need to know. So we have on our list, we have obviously we're going to stop at Benbridge potentially. Freshwater Bay on the other side of the Isle of Wight. Swanage Bay, Weymouth, Salcombe, sorry, Dartmouth, then Salcombe, and then Plymouth is also another one we've chucked on the list. We'll check tide uh, times and heights separately, and so we know then if we are making way to them, then whereabouts, <laughs> what we'll find when we get there, I suppose, yeah. Um, but yeah, so now we've got the other chart out and we can see the Isle of Wight over there, and yeah, a few options. So depending if we've got a southerly or something like that, then we could Instead of going Sandown Bay, when we go to the other side there, let's St Helens or something like that to anchor. But if we are making that decision to um, shoot around the uh, St Catharines in one go, then we can, if we get tired or whatever, we you know we can stop in at Freshwater Bay there. So we're just going to look up that now. But if we keep going and we're on, running on adrenaline and we're giddy and <laughs> with ex the excitement of sailing, but then we get to about here and we get a bit stuck, um, you know, we can either sort of say, well, Swanage is over there, or we can get into Weymouth, Weymouth Bay there, before tackling uh, the Portland Bill there. If none of that happens and we're still running on adrenaline, then really we're just tackling Lion Bay in one go because the the distance, I mean, if you're out here and something goes wrong, then it's the same, you know, same sort of distance to land from, you know, either side of there as it is to go back that way there. Potentially, if you get to Sulcombe, then you could either sort of go up the river, river Dart there if, you know, something bad was happening here and you didn't want to tackle it in one go. So that's probably then the refuge we'd, we'd, we'd note down there. Um, and also Sulcombe itself. And then after that, we've, um, yeah, we've got a straight shot then really to Falmouth. But um, yeah, maybe a refuge point might be um, Plymouth, Plymouth Sound there. But other than that, really, you kind of might as well just keep going to Falmouth and then you've got Helford River or River Fowl as we mentioned. So. so this is a good thing and this is why you need to check your refuge um, spots and just pre-check them and pre-prepare before you go because we've had a little look at Swanage Bay because that was the one we thought we'd be able to stop in at but actually reading this it does not sound like a really good place to stop at all um amenable if somewhat insecure anchorages in the right weather conditions and it's basically a no-go in easterlies and uh, like very bad layers of sand and rock and basically just not a place we want to stop so we're now reading this it says that studland bay would be a better place for us to stop so i've looked at that and apparently it's really good um good holdings it's free um so i think studland bay is going to be the place that we're going to stop for the if we do Hopefully we don't have to, but if we yeah. if we can, as a point of refuge. But that's that is the beauty of it. Yeah, if we were out there in a in a in a pickle and um, needed to have a quick safe haven, then we'd have got there and maybe not found the ground to be as you know yeah as good as we wanted it to. And then it would have been okay. Well, where next? And then it would have been a, a right. It'd been a bit scary. And there's yeah. also some sort of like danger spots around Swanish. So like Peveril Point is um, basically a no go area. Um, so yeah, so it's very important to read these, otherwise you can definitely end up in a bit of trouble. Yeah. So Studland Bay. Studland Bay stands immediately south of Pool Harbour entrance, west of Handfast Point. It is one of the most important passage anchorages in the channel. With good holding and fine shelter in west and southwest winds, there are lovely views and a small village about a quarter of a mile inshore with the pig on the beach, which is a really nice place to go, I've been before, um, for high class dining. Beautiful. I went for cocktails, but it's very, very nice. Um, the beach, which is grand for families, is said to be eroding rapidly. Oh dear. Um, Studland remains one of the south coast's most popular stopovers. Sometimes it's too popular in the summer weekends, but boats thin out around sunset with the casuals returning to Pearl Harbour. It can be approached without difficulty, so leave Old Harry Rocks to port, noting shoal water immediately west of the stacks sound in to find a suitable depth and let go. While anchored here, spare a thought for old Harry himself. Harry Pay was a local hero and a privateer who distinguished himself by making life hell for the French and for the local custom collectors alike. So yeah, these are great and they come up with some very kind of, yeah, cute little points about towns and places, so yeah. Thanks Lauren. No worries. 
Okay, fast forward a day because we got too tired and it was all a bit too much for the evening, so we went to bed. But yeah, just to conclude, uh, thanks for watching the episode and getting through what was probably a bit of a different episode than what we usually do. It was probably a little bit boring if you aren't interested in passage planning but um yeah it's only a light touch we haven't gone into like all the sort of tidal curves and everything like that because it's yeah we could, we could get a bit full on that is for us what we go through so we just get out the charts we get out the tidal streams and the pilotage books we note down anything of interest we note down some bolt holes that we can go to if we get in trouble and we just kind of plot it out and see how long it's going to take if we're doing a sort of 4.5 knot average speed or something like that so yeah we don't really go into it any further than that um yeah it was but, a brief overview yeah just a brief overview so a little bit of a different episode we'll show you some sailing next week stay tuned for that <laughs> but what i wanted to show you uh just at the end of this video was also how we then apply some of the apps to this and how you can get the benefit from using both charts and applications to to get from a to b so you might know already that we use savvy navi and i will just show you a couple of little bits from savvy navi now that i think have really helped us during the passage planning session so one notable bit in the app is anchorages and finding a lot of detail about the anchorages that we're going to and ones that aren't going to appear in the shell channel guide or the MRA channel guide and things like that. So here's something we think we will find pretty useful when coming into um, different areas and thinking about anchoring. So one of our little bolt holes is Sulcom Estuary and here is how we will use the Savvy Navi app in combination with chart paper charts and also the um, sort of channel guides and pilotage books here. On our wider view chart here, there's really not much detail about the Sulcom Estuary. So we do have a um, bigger version of the chart, um, but actually in this um, West Country cruising companion, it does have the um, enlarged version of that so we can get into the detail. So if we were to come in here, we'd be thinking, right, well, if it's a quick bolt hole and a quick stop, then we might be looking at some anchorage options and you'd be looking for the little anchor marks um, like this one here or a little bit further up uh, the estuary there. You've got a couple of anchor marks there. Is that an option for us to anchor or, or are there some visitor pontoons? There's one there, for example, and then there's plenty of mooring balls, it looks like, all along the way there. So if we were to choose the option of the anchor, then we would look at the Savvy Navi app for a little bit more detail. So we've chosen Solcom. Actually, as you zoom in, a couple more options appear. So they're all labeled there. Um, but we'll choose the one that it's showing here in the pilotage book and we'll get a bit more information. So let's zoom in. So this is near um, well, Sunny Cove is what it's labeled as here. And let's have a look. So Sunny Cove, we've got a rating of two stars. And if we swipe up on that, we've got a little picture here of, of what it should look like from Google Earth, I imagine. And let's have a look. So the mooring type is the is an anchor. Uh, seabed, it's mud and sand. The protection is from the southeast and the east. And it's a beach by dinghy. And then you also got a couple of reviews or, or there's one here for people that have been to the area and good enough to leave a little comment about what you might expect to find there. So Peter here has given it two stars. This is really valuable information. So, well, not to read it all there, but um, things like deeper draft boats need uh, to be further out on the five meter contour. There's a riptide and overfalls in north of bay. So that's, yeah, it's kind of, invaluable information that you might think well, cool. well instead of choosing that anchorage then um, let's look a little bit further up the estuary and pick one of the other ones and then also you've got um, weather and tides for the chosen days that um, that you might be there yeah and if you like the look of it then you just add a waypoint and then you press gps and it will take you there yeah that's i think a little um little use for a combination of charts and paper pilotage books things like that and modern technology so pretty good thanks for watching everybody hope you enjoyed the episode and the next episode we'll hopefully have some more sailing and solar arches and more fun stuff so thank you for um watching our episode and hopefully you found it interesting mm -hmm.